When tracking the relationships between the major animal classifications, we're going to rely on homologies, and we're also going to have a particular kind of homology that's a really ugly world called pedomorphosis. This is a branch of all the major groups of animals that we're going to cover very briefly. It's just here as a signpost as we go through a number of key innovations and changes in the history of the animals. So we start out with single-celled protists, like the protozoa, and we get multicellularity at about 600 million years ago. And from this, we're going to see lineages arise that are radially symmetric, bilaterally symmetric, things that have a coelom or don't, and go all the way up at the very top here to things with backbones. But we want to start out simple. And we want to start with the origins of multicellularity, reminding ourselves that this is the first innovation on the way to animals. It's the origin of the animals themselves. We had the colonial protists, the coanoflagellates. Each one of these can live separate, independent life, but they have adhesives on their cell surface that allow them to stick together and form colonies. And the sponge has quite similar cells to this that actually have this flagella that create a little current that brings little particles in that they can feed on. Now, after the origins of the sponges, there was a key event and this gave rise to those animals with radial ancestry or radial symmetry. Now, by radial symmetry, we're talking about the spokes of a wheel around in a circle, around the radius of a wheel. And these include things like medusas, sea anemones, jellyfishes. They're all pretty much jellyfishy type things. And you can see every one of them has a single orifice that allows the food to come in. They can shut it for a while. They digest the food and then they poop it back out through their mouth. Okay? And all of these have got a hydrostatic skeletal system so they can push off a little bit. They're just stiff enough to be able to move around as a whole organism in the case of these free living things or at least move their tentacles in the case of the sea anemones. And then they're radially symmetric. So they've got the symmetry of the spokes of a wheel. From them, at some point, organisms show then a bilateral ancestry, a bilateral symmetry. And bilateral means you're symmetrical from left to the right. You have a left ear and a right ear, a left eye and a right eye. And to get this, we have to know this really ugly word, pedomorphosis. And this is where adults retain the juvenile traits of their ancestors. Okay? So let's consider a favorite cartoon character, perhaps, for many people, Family Guy. Here's the dad, and here's this annoying little brat named Stewie, right? He's supposedly just a couple of years old. But Stewie has visions of grandeur, okay? And he would very much, if he could, like to start reproducing, okay? Now, if Stewie was successful and was able to reproduce, then we'd expect his children only to grow up to be the same general shape and with the same general characteristics of him. Okay, rather than going all the rest of the way through development. Let's consider the life cycle of the medusa, which at some growth phase looks like a sea anemone with tentacles and others more like a free-living jellyfish. And so these, when they reproduce, the fertilized egg grows into a larva down here. And then if the larva continues growing, then you have these stalks that grow off and you have the tentacles of an anemone and sometimes they bud off and then form these free-living jellyfish type things. All the adult form are characterized by radial symmetry. But this larval phase is not radially symmetric. Instead, it's bilaterally symmetric. The left is the same as the right. And the early zoologists recognized that this larval form of the medusa provides a perfect template for the body plan of these things, flatworms, bilaterally symmetric and having the shape and form of a juvenile jellyfish. These are bilaterally symmetric, same on the left as on the right. Now, if we look at some of these flatworms, some of these organisms are quite remarkably 
uh, evolved. They have a brain, they have eyes, they have nerves. Jellyfish don't have eyes. Sponges don't have brains, neither do jellyfish. So these are the first things that we see with the nervous system. They also have a digestive system, but it's a closed digestive system. So just like the jellyfish, the mouth, food comes in and is digested rather efficiently inside and is pooped back out through the mouth. Okay, so it's a closed digestive system. And like a jellyfish, they still have a hydrostatic skeletal system. So like a water balloon, they require on having the ability to kind of shut their mouth and then push against themselves to move around through the water. Okay, so these are the bilaterally symmetric organisms. We've seen the flatworms. There are other kinds of worms here. And what we next want to look at are the coelomates. And these are going to give rise to a lot of much more complicated organisms. Now, a coelom is a body cavity, okay? And in this case, the body cavity is separated from the outer body, okay? So you have the body covering in this earthworm, and then you have the coelom, the digestive tract, is suspended inside. It's not directly attached to the outer wall. And so this allows for greater flexibility and mobility. So you can move around, wriggle as you wish, and you don't get your guts in a twist. So we see the coelom in the early development, and we have a coelom as adults, but it's already present in embryonic development in our earliest phases uh, in human embryos. So here's the coelom here. There's a stalk. So it is part, it is attached, but it's mostly able to move around on its own, the digestive system inside the body cavity. Okay, so from the coelomates, we're going to have these two branches, the protostomes, which give rise to the mollusks, the annelids, and the arthropods, and then the deuterostomes that give rise to the echinoderms and the chordates. The distinction between protostomes and deuterostomes relies solely on details in early development. Both of these groups of organisms start out as a single fertilized cell. They undergo cell division at mitosis, the 2, 4, 8, 16, 32 cell phase. But there's a difference by the time you get to the 32 cell stage. The protostomes, the cells line up in a form that from the top looks like a spiral. So if we look down on it, these are going around kind of a corkscrew. So there's spiral cleavage. The deuterostomes, on the other hand, they go through again the 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, but these are all lined up in a straight line. So that's radial cleavage. Okay. Now as they then continue through their development, the protostomes all have a very consistent pattern, and that initial opening in that cavity of the blastula, this ball of cells is called a blastula, and it opens up down here, and this initial opening eventually becomes the animal's mouth. It then goes all the way to the, through the other end, so it's now an open digestive system, and that's the anus, okay? The deuterostomes, they get to that 32 cell phase, they again have a blastula, again you have the infolding at the bottom, but down here the initial opening ends up as the anus rather than the mouth. So the distinction, depending on your point of view, if you're a protostome, you would say that the deuterostomes are ass backwards. So either way, these are coelomates. There is this open digestive system in that you've got a mouth at one end and an anus at the other, and the Digestive system is not attached to the outer body wall, so it has a coelom. So these are all coelomates. It's the details in the early development that give rise to this distinction between the two major groups. So we have our protostome branch, mollusks, annelids, and arthropods. And of these, we have some really cool things. Amongst the mollusks, we've already seen the octopus. The octopus is a glorious thing that has tentacles, it moves around, it's got a brain, it's got a really excellent 
eye, perfectly good vision, and it still has, though, a hydrostatic skeletal system. Just like a jellyfish, just like a flatworm, it relies on the terger of these cells to push off against each other in order to move around. Now, amongst the mollusks, we see that their larvae have a funny characteristic. So it's like a tadpole. So it has the head and the digestive system is all up here, but it also has a tail. And the tail is segmented. And it's the segmentation that actually gives away the linkages between the mollusks and the annelids. These are all segmented. The earthworms are segmented. And so we have mollusks and annelids in this group together. And related to them are the arthropods, which again have the segmentation. And the very simplest arthropods are like the centipede. You have a leg and a body segment and just goes on all the way through the body, a pair of legs and a body segment as we go along. And we see this way, way back. So these are fossil trilobites. So these are arthropods. They're like insects and crabs and things, segmented bodies, uh, and an external skeleton. Now, let's look at a spider, which is a wonderful example of a highly evolved arthropod. It, again, has a heart, just like the squid had a heart. It has eyes, it has a brain, it has a stomach, it's got all this cool stuff, right? And it's a wonderful predator, okay? So in the same way that the squid, the octopus, have to be mobile to be able to grab their prey, to be able to move quickly, they have to have good vision to do so, so does the spider. It has to have the sense organs necessary to be a predator of other animals. But it has an exoskeleton. And an exoskeleton is a huge limitation on what's possible for these arthropods. The largest insect in the world today is this cricket from New Zealand. That's a big grasshopper, big cricket, but it would fit in the palm of your hand, no bigger than that. The largest spider, here's a tarantula from Oklahoma, again about the size of a hand. In the fossil record, the largest insects that flew were these dragonflies from about 300 million years ago. So its body length would be well over a foot long, and it had a two and a half foot wingspan. But that's it. That's as big as they could get. You have this heavy exoskeleton. You have the muscles on the inside. They're leveraging against things, and it limits how big these organisms could ever get. So in their evolutionary history, they're never much bigger than these. Okay. Final group, we're going to go to the big classification of the deuterostomes. The deuterostomes, uh, again, we see are distinguished from the protostomes on those details of early development, the spiral versus radial cleavage, uh, as well as which end is the anus and which end is the mouth. And the first ones along this line are the echinoderms. And the echinoderms include such really exciting, highly evolved organisms as starfishes which is not impressive at all. They don't have a brain. They don't have eyes. And also, these things show radial symmetry again. Okay? If we look at the larvae of the sea urchins, however, sea urchins, like starfish, are echinoderms, they do have bilateral symmetry. And it's from the larva, then, that we see the body plan for descendants that then gave rise to what are now the chordates. The chordates are going to include a very interesting group over here called the vertebrates, which include us. So you have the larval echinoderm, bilaterally symmetric, gives rise to the body form of these different kinds of sea squirts and things that can swim around. So the Sea squirts, the hemichordates here, again, not very impressive. They just stay stuck to the ground. They don't have a brain. They don't have eyes. Nothing much going on there. But they have tadpoles. And the tadpole phase of these and of urochordates have got an interesting shape. So it's a similar form as the tadpole of a sea squirt. 
and these now uricordates can move around and they have a segmentation here in the tail and this is clearly an antecedent to what's going to become a backbone. Okay? Here we have yet more. These are chordates. These are not vertebrates yet. But these are called lancelets. Okay? They have that segmentation inside. And this is what they can push off against. A much more efficient way to move rapidly than relying on that flimsy hydrostatic system or the exoskeleton of an insect. But they don't have a brain. They don't have eyes. Once we have this form, however, this gave rise to the first fishes. You have the segmentation in the backbones now of a proper vertebrate. And from this, we get eyes and we get brains. The key thing here for our evolutionary trajectory of our lineage, the vertebrates, is we have this flexible endoskeleton. We have in these early placoderms, these are a fossil armored fish, a very rapidly mobile predator that could go around eating things that were much slower than itself. And these are antecedents then to the glass catfish, which is one of many different kinds of bony fishes around the world today. The key for using this as an example is you can clearly see all the different vertebrae, the ribs that are attached to the muscles so that they can have a fantastic push and move very, very rapidly through the water. And you can also see their brain inside there, and obviously they have very large eyes. So in reviewing the basis for these large-scale classifications of the animals, I have wanted to focus your attention on common ancestry, and I've also wanted you to be aware of certain patterns of convergent evolution. First, let's look at those homologies. So we saw that the type of symmetry, all the jellyfishes and sea anemones are radially symmetric. Virtually everything else has bilateral symmetry. Pedomorphosis is an incredibly important form of homology where you have the ancestral trait found only in the larvae of the previous form now present in the, dis the adult form of the descendants. Whether you have an open or closed gut or a coelom, these are really important for making these kinds of classifications. Developmental pathways, as we saw in the distinction between the deuterostomes and the protostomes, these are highly conserved. Once a particular developmental pathway was followed, it was, it was conserved very strongly. We also saw segmentation. So in summarizing these homologies, we first get to become animals, we're so multicellular. All animals are multicellular. Then there was the radial ancestry giving rise to this whole group, and all of these show bilateral ancestry. And then we have the origins of a coelom within the digestive system, the details of how that coelom develops in the early embryo, makes the distinction between the protostomes, which we'll say from our point of view up here as deuterostomes, they're ass backwards, and we're ass backwards. Okay, and so of this then we have these major classifications based on these large-scale homologies. Within that, we had these particular forms of pedomorphosis. So we have a bilaterally symmetric larva of the sea anemones that give the body plan for various different kinds of worms and all of these other coelomites up here. Within the protostomes, we have the segmentation that the larval form of the mollusk gave rise to the body plan of the annelids, the earthworms and things, and then the larval form of the sea urchin gives the body plan for the chordates, and then the tadpole even of the chordates gives the body plan for the modern vertebrates. So pedomorphosis its an important kind of homology where the adult descendants retain traits of the ancestral larvae. So, in disentangling all these things, we did see a lot of analogies. And the analogies included the way you get around, limbs and fins, the circulatory system, vision, hearing, brains, the sense organs that have evolved repeatedly. So if we look at these, we see that vision evolved here in the flatworms, in the mollusks, in the arthropods, and in the chordates. That's four separate evolutionary events for vision. 
hearts evolved. Ribbon worms have hearts. The protostomes have hearts. And then the chordates have hearts. Brains evolved separately in mollusks, in arthropods, and in the chordates. So these are extraordinarily conserved, but the origins of them are analogous. So how accurate has this proven to be? I've given you what's almost a speed zoology course in less than an hour, going through the deductions that were made over 100 years ago by the early zoologists. And remarkably, it's turned out that their major classifications were correct. Now that we have the DNA, that we see what are the precise sequences that code for all these different traits, we can get genetic distances across the major classificatory units in the animals. And indeed, it turns out, yes, that these distinctions between the echinoderms and the chordates, which gave rise to the lancelets and then the vertebrates, they are closely related to each other. And they are then the protostomes versus deuterostomes. That distinction, is re we can see it likewise in this distinction between these two groups. And further back then were the different kinds of worms and the different kinds of jellyfishes. So these major classifications were made well over a century ago. And it's now possible to test how accurate they were using molecular data. With DNA sequences, we can see all the different genes that are involved in coding for these different traits. And it turns out the early zoologists were correct. That funny distinction between deuterostomes and protostomes, that minor detail about radial cleavage and which end is the anus and which is the mouth, really is a landmark of a distinction that dates back 579 million years ago. You have all the annelids, mollusks, and uh, other protostomes down here being very different from the deuterostomes, the starfishes, and the chordates, and then ultimately the vertebrates. And then the fact that we are closely related to the starfishes compared to how closely we're related to clams and bugs and things, yes, that's right. The distinction here is that we have our most recent common ancestor from the chordate lineage is with the echinoderms. So, to summarize all this, it is very, very clear that all animals diversified from a single common ancestor. They repeatedly evolved the necessary physical traits for obtaining food.